Welcome everyone to the Valuable 500 Story So Far Hour. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, uh, and if you've been coming to the Zero Project for a long time, uh, how could you not know me and this crazy green shirt? Uh, my name is Caroline Casey, and I am currently the founder, troublemaker behind the Valuable 500. And the Valuable 500 is the global CEO community committed to transforming disability inclusion through business leadership and opportunity. I've been asked to kind of give you the story so far um, because believe it or not, this community is only two years old. The Valuable 500 was launched on the main stage of the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2019, and it had a sole intention of breaking the global business leadership silence on disability business inclusion. And why was that so important? Well, we're gonna start off this hour with a film. And this film, I remember when we created it and it was done for us by AMV BDDO. And in a way, it was a film that wanted to challenge leadership, wanted to challenge our thinking about why disability has remained on the sidelines of business for so long. What was the reason for it? What is the reality? We cannot deny that inclusion should mean everyone for all. But for a very long time, Diversity and inclusion has focused on maybe one or two key areas and disability has often been overlooked or invisible. And so this film is trying to capture the reality, or it's certainly the reality back in 2019. And I remember when we did this film, I was terrified that, <laughs> I was so terrified that this film was going to get me into serious trouble um, because it was holding a mirror to the corporate world. And the thing is, it's really serious because right now, 2020, only 3% of articles published about diversity and inclusion mention the word disability. It's just, that is just terrifying. And so now, in a way, I'm so glad that we had the courage to create this film, which won a can lion. Um, and everything about this film, every scenario in this film is true and it is real. Um, it's not actually a real situation because we probably get sued, but it is based on real life stories and events. So I am going to now launch our film, Diversish. So this year you've announced that diversity is at the heart of your brand agenda. How does that address disability? That's a terrific question. And the thing is, I think this is all about inclusivity. Yeah. So this year, for instance, Chris, we sponsored a float at the Gay Parade. Yeah. We have women. Lots of women. Mm. I mean, they're like everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Tim's Asian. And gay too. Which is great. Which is great. Two for one, right there. <laughs> so, have you ever had people with disabilities appear in your advertising? For sure. Sure we have. Yeah. I'm sure we have. Yeah. I would think that is super likely. So. We're 100% committed to considering a range of clothing for the disabled. You know, further on down the line. So this is Bill. Uh, he's paraplegic, isn't that right, Sharon? And, uh... You're on our diversity page on our website, aren't you, Bill? Yes, I'm the only one currently. Tremendous, on tremendous addition to the team. Disability is something that we are committed to investing in very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 2019 is déjà consacré à célébrer la femme, l'avenir est féminin et tout ça. The 2019 is earmarked for BAME, BAME, 
means a lot to me personally. 2020? Ice caps. 2021? Mindfulness. Because. Do you have a year in mind for people with disabilities? Well, mm, yes, absolutely. I mean, just watch this space. <laughs> That's what I can say. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, as you can see, <laughs> that film is, it makes you feel queasy and it makes you feel really, really uncomfortable. There was a stat at the end of that film that's really important, that 90% of our companies claim to be passionate about diversity and inclusion, and yet only 4% consider disability. And this is what the Valuable 500 was set up to change. It is not okay anymore for any company to talk about diversity and inclusion if it is consciously or unconsciously completely leaving out 15 to 20% of our global population. We know that 1.3 billion people in the world have a lived experience of disability, of which I am one. And with a mother and a father, that is just over 72% of our global economy. First of all, it's just not right. And it's an inclusion delusion for any company to say they do inclusion and they don't do disability. That's just insane. But the other part of it is, it's also insane for a company to overlook this extraordinary community. This community that has a market that we estimate is about a trillion this community that is about insight and innovation and opportunity for brand differentiation and growth. And particularly now, as we're supposedly building back better, how on earth can we build back better if we consistently turn a blind eye to the disability community? The Valuable 500 wanted to change that stat. But the other thing the Valuable 500 was aware of was many of us who have been involved in disability business inclusion for many decades, what feels like lifetimes, could see that there was great things happening. There are great pockets and examples of success where companies are, and individuals, are coming up with things that work. But we were not seeing scaled change. It was piecemeal. And we were not seeing the change that we wanted to see. So we believed that the missing piece to scaling this change, to radically transforming the business system, to equally include disability, to integrate disability across the supply chains was business leadership. Leaders make choices and those choices create culture in the shadow and the light of a leader. Now what's so terrifying again is that in 2019, we hadn't had business CEOs stand with and for the disability community, certainly not in the same way that we had seen in other issues. It's like leaders didn't talk about it. It's like leaders didn't have any relationship with it. Well, so we went out to prove that that was wrong. We asked EY to do some research for us. And here is the result of that. 7% of our C-suite have a lived experience of disability, but four out of five of them are hiding it. So what does that tell you about the culture of the organization? What does that tell you about how disability is understood and respected for the point of view and the market that it brings to business? The second stat, 54% of our global boards had never had a conversation about disability. What we don't speak about becomes a problem. We know that. What we speak about, what we, we can imagine and we can innovate and we can change. 54% is half of our global companies were never talking about disability. It, it never came up. 
we weren't even, there are no targets, there's no metrics. It's like it was invisible. And that's why the Valuable 500 had to exist. It had to exist to make sure that every single company would understand about the disability community. So our job with those stats was to go out and break that silence. We knew that we could if we got a collective number. Imagine if we could get, I don't know, 500 of the world's most important CEOs and their brands to, to put disability on their leadership agenda. We weren't looking for their money. We were looking for their attention and intention. And I want to introduce you now to the global CEO of EY. And I think in this small clip that you will see that I did with him as an interview on the 3rd of December of 2020, you can see what, that, what good leadership looks like. Leaders who are willing to stand up and say, you know what, we've got to do something about this. And his name is Carmine De Sibio. So we're just going to play that. We have 300,000 people globally. And my purpose in this role is to inspire and lead 300,000 people. And that means all 300,000. So even if you put a percentage on it and you mentioned before, I don't know what the right percent, 15% of the people have some kind of disability, that's 45,000 people in our world. And that's, you know, that's a big piece of our, of our organization. And therefore we have to be inclusive. We have to be inclusive. It's not just about doing good, it's about really doing well and, and making sure that our business thrives. So, you know, it's part of what I do every day. I enjoy interacting with people and I make sure that we have an inclusive environment. So what's so powerful when you hear Carmine speaking to it, you know that Carmine is not tick boxing or doing it because it's a good thing to look like he's doing. I've met Carmine a few times and he is actually, he's just a real human leader. He, he's, he's fantastic. But when a leader like that, who is over 300,000 employees says, I care, I will learn, I want to do more, then more gets done. Imagine what it would be like to have 500 of that those kind of leaders. So armed with our research and our film, as I said, on the main stage of the World Economic Forum in 2019, we launched this iconic search to find 500 of the world's most intentional CEOs. And what we were asking them to do was, with their signature, give us their honor and, and ensure that disability had been brought to board level, they would make a leadership commitment and then communicate that commitment to their employees. And then the Valuable 500 will communicate that to the rest of the world. That would be 500 commitments. The thing is that might sound really small and people might be suspicious, like really, is it just a charter? Is it just a tick box? No, it's not. The whole point was to break the silence, is to get a critical mass of leaders who would create a community and that community could revolutionize the business system to integrate and infuse disability inclusion throughout it strategically. 500, where do you begin? Well, there's a big long story about how we began and it includes horses, elephants, Columbia, remortgaging a house and lots of really strange stuff, but it really began with one, one man. Sometimes you don't need, when you're trying to make change happen, you don't need to change everybody's mind. You just need to often find one. One who is willing to back you all the way, to push you and not allow you give up. And for us, the very first global CEO, believe it or not, to stand up with and for disability in 2019, 
and say, we've got to do this better. There's a man called Paul Pullman. And he was the CEO of Unilever. He's the CEO that is credited on creating sustainability movement. He is the one that truly believed and pushed against all the odds over a decade ago, saying that we need to do purpose-driven business and deliver not just to our shareholders, but to our stakeholders. And when we deliver with purpose to our stakeholders, we deliver to our shareholders. Now, what better kind of person could we have to try to create this movement? So I just want to show this little clip that we did with Paul um, as part of our Bloomberg Valuable Leader conversations. And you can check a few of those out on the Valuable 500 website. But I just picked these first sort of two minutes because you'll just see what kind of a leader Paul is. And he actually speaks to what we believe in the Valuable 500, which is the two parts of this piece that are important, the head and the heart, the stats and the story. This is not just about the business case, it's about the human case. And what makes this so compelling, because everything we believe in the Valuable 500, it is merging business and humanity. It's the intersection of that. And I guess that's maybe how we've done so well so far. So let's just have a quick look at Paul. It is fabulous to have you doing the Bloomberg Valuable Conversation, because you are our chairman and our very first valuable leader. So let's just start from the beginning. What does the role of what is the role of business when we talk about human inclusion, and what is it that the CEOs or the business need, business leaders need to do? What's their play? Well, Caroline, thanks for the opportunity, and obviously thanks for what you are doing. But uh, what is very important is that this world currently isn't functioning as well as it should. And I think we have a wonderful opportunity here with the Valuable 500 to work on some of the things that matter. The fact that we are more connected than people think, the fact that we need to strive for diversity and inclusion across the world, that with the enormous force of business that what business represents in society, it perhaps can drive these higher moral values at the time that the politicians seem to have a hard time doing that. And then the role of the valuable leader, which has to obviously start with the tone of the top, is, is the CEOs that we are talking about and targeting specifically, that they are internalizing that, not only intellectually, but also emotionally with the heart. And the organization will notice if that is the case or not. So what we're talking here about is the basic human values on which society should function, and we should always fight for that. So one of the statistics that we learned with our EY research is 7% of our C-suite have a disability, yet four out of five of them are hiding it, no. okay? And yet, yet, yet you stood up. So I wanna know why don't you think leaders are coming out of the closet about their disability, and why did you stand up? Because you do so much, <laughs> you do so much, so Well, why? it's not so much, I, I do the same thing, which is to de defend the basic human values on which society is based. If we don't live in a world where there is dignity and respect for everybody, where there is equity, equal opportunities for everybody, and where there is a sense of compassion that we can put ourselves in the shoes of others so that we can understand what others really want to create this inclusive society. If we lose these basic human values, we lose humanity. So so when politicians speak out against an LGBT community or make racial comments or any of the other basic values that underpin this, we actually destroy the fabric of society. And here again, if you look at disability, which affects 1.3 billion people, which is 15% of the world population, we haven't given it that attention. And if you look at the statistics of exclusion in any part of the world, not just in the developing markets, in any part of the world, then we have a job to do to create that dignity and respect. I absolutely look wrecked in that film. I'm looking at that going, I, I, I think I look about 90 years old. And I felt 90 years old, I'll be really honest. Um, it was just kind of quite shortly after we had launched in Davos, I think it was somewhere around April, in 2019, and I was shattered. <laughs> I just, it was just 
full throttle, you know, with so little. I mean, we launched and we had Paul Poman as our chairperson and the Virgin Media, and we had Omnicom and One Young World as our strategic partners. And we did get that main stage in Davos to do that. We broke all the history. We went against all the odds. And, and we started, I think we left Davos that week and we had 11 companies sign. I mean, Satya Nadelli was one of the first and Julie, Julie Sweet stood uh, for Accenture. I mean, it started and I remember thinking, oh my God, 10 companies, that's like 490 to go. How are we going to do it? And we were a tiny team. When we launched at Davos, there were two of us, two of us. So I don't think I probably, we even ate for a year because we certainly didn't have enough money to. But I remember that so well when Peter Grauer, who's the chair of Bloomberg, he was one of the five CEOs who, who sat on that stage, on the main stage of Davos. And you should go and check it out in the World Economic Forum. And he says this incredible thing. As a chair of Bloomberg, as a leader of his ilk, he stood, he kind of sat back and went, you know what? I'm kind of proud about this and this, but I know I'm not doing enough around disability inclusion. I thank you. Thank you for being accountable. Thank you for saying that you weren't doing enough because what that did was it gave permission for all the other CEOs on that stage to drop their shoulders and actually go, yeah, neither are we, but we want to. And so when we did the, when we came off the stage, I remember we're like, well, this is my chance. So I went to Peter and I said, Peter, I have this idea about getting leaders like you to have conversations. Will Bloomberg do it for us? And they did. Actually, Bloomberg became, I think, my, was it maybe our 11th company to become part of the Valuable 500? So by the time we got to April, I was exhausted. But I will never forget those months. It was just pure fire. Like we were, something was happening and something was changing. And by the time that we had got to Davos in 2020, just as the pandemic was about to begin, we arrived again back into the main stage at a press conference to announce that we had 240 companies. <laughs> like that's unreal in a year. And I don't even know how we got it, but that's definitely telling you how tired we all were. And it's something was felt like it could change. And companies weren't coming in just because they wanted to look good. It wasn't a pure exercise. There was something really meaningful happening. And I think it was because we were trying to create a space where companies could learn from each other and give companies permission not to know it all, but to at least have the intention to do so. And then the pandemic happened. And I was supposed to go on honeymoon for three months. Well, you can forget that, definitely didn't happen. And in some ways like perfect universal timing <laughs> because another extraordinary thing happens. Because of the unprecedented success of the Valuable 500, we were asked to consider doing a phase two. You must remember, we started off as a campaign to break this silence, but something had happened. Because we were talking C-suite, because we were global, because we were talking about the power of the supply chain, not just about employment. Because the issue is you cannot, you cannot convince CEOs or leaders or businesses to employ people with disability until you connect it to the value of the market or the intelligence and the insight. And that's what we were doing. But we weren't doing it on our own. We had this plethora of a huge ecosystem of friends and partners around the world who were working with us. We talked about global collaboration and collective intelligence and nobody could ignore us. And it was incredible. I mean, I don't know how many years I've been carrying around this dream and suddenly it was right. It was like there's nothing more potent than an idea whose time has come and it felt like our time had come. And I was so scared because with the pandemic, it was like, we won't be able to get around the world and to convince everybody and do everything. But something unbelievable happened because the pandemic not only gave the Valuable 500 team the time to even consider the strategy of what we could do with phase two, what we could do with this powerful community, but it also made the case for this community. 
because we all know what's happened in this year. We all know the darkness, the sense of exclusion, how people's lives have been affected, people with disabilities, sometimes more so than anybody else whose lives have been affected. And, and yet, something else happened is that we saw our business systems could change when they wanted to. The system that they said they couldn't do remote working before because it was too costly, it was too difficult. No, guess what? It happened right under our noses. We saw mainstreaming, the tools that people with disabilities have been using for a long time. The innovations that we have helped build from our different lived experience. So we saw a system could change. And then the voices started to roar louder because in the murder, after the murder of George Floyd, we realize again how much we are overlooking the gross inequity and inequality and injustice in our world. And we all had to face ourselves again. And in this time with these tools of social media, here they were. Here these tools were, and the voices of the next generation. And amongst all of this, we were starting to hear about young people shouting around disability pride, seeing people with disabilities frontlining fashion campaigns. I mean, stuff was starting to happen. And now the companies were starting to call the Valuable 500. And we, there were some weeks that we actually got 20 companies into the Valuable 500 without having to persuade and ask, without having to fight, because companies are realizing, oh, now, now as we choose to change our system, we know no growth can happen without it being inclusive growth. And we know inclusion can't happen without everybody. And we know that we have to future-proof our businesses and our brands and one way of doing that is through this community. This community that we haven't really looked at before. So as of January 29th, we reached 415 companies. That represents 17 million employees, 36 countries, 56 sectors. We are the second biggest CEO community in the world on any issue after UN Global Compact, which is kind of cool. I don't mind being second place because they've got 14,000 companies and CEOs. And at the same time that we were bringing these companies into our community, the companies were asking for help and they were telling us what the barriers were. And so we kept using this community to get the research about what could we do with you now? What would phase two look like? And so we started to design phase two with all of our Valuable 500 community and the disability community. And we crafted and created a transformational change program that we could, if we got the funding, activate that community. How powerful would that be to get 500 organizations, all of their employees, the power of their supply chain and their customers to hack the solution for disability business inclusion. And let's put a target on it. Let's say three years, nothing less than global business system change for the inclusion of people with disabilities. Because if people with disabilities potential is released, all of our potential is released. And if we came to it with an intersectional approach, an integrated approach, integrating disability business inclusion, looking at the interdependency of the value and supply chain, looking at the different functions in the business, looking at the different generation, our younger generation, what could they teach our current CEOs? And so we designed this transformational program, looking at how we could activate our community under three internal areas for change, leadership, culture, and brand, and three external areas where we could collectively use the community to fill in the gaps around reporting, research, data, and representation. And then all we needed so that we wouldn't have to charge our companies to be part of membership, but that they would put their money and resources into investing in all of our partners around the world for their consultancy and skills, because we were not going to do that. So that they would invest in people who would help them become better. And then we got the brilliant news, which was announced on Friday the 29th. 
And that news was that the Nippon Foundation, who I met at zero through Michael Fenbeck, have made the singular biggest philanthropic investment into disability business inclusion ever. The Nippon Foundation under Mr. Sasakawa has invested 5 million into the second phase of the Valuable 500 over three years. Well, first of all, that means I can actually sleep and not look exhausted <laughs> because I, it's been so hard. And there's been moments when it's been so frightening that you, will we give up? We had nothing. Would I be able to pay people for Christmas? But somehow I made it through. And so this interview that I want to show you now is, is Aishiro, who is the Director of International Relations in the Nippon Foundation, who worked so hard for us with the Nippon Foundation to make this happen. And I know that I, I know everybody thought I was crazy with the Valuable 500 for a long time, and times it felt like we were. But what's amazing for me is sometimes, sometimes the magic is there and you just didn't even expect it. Uh, and Nippon for me are like, they've released a whole heap of potential into the world. Um, so have a look. Well, good morning, Ashiro. Thank you, I thank you, Jamal. I, I think it is, a, it actually is a year ago today that I met Mr. Sasakawa in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, it's a year ago. Um, so just for everybody listening, um, will you just, I'm going, to, I'm going to explain a little bit about, so for people who are visually impaired, um, mm -hmm. I have a gray background. I'm wearing my electric green shirt. I have blonde mm -hmm. hair and glasses that make me look like Edna from The Incredibles. Um, and I'm Caroline Casey. Do you want to describe your background and tell us who you are and what you currently sure. do? Sure. Um, well, at the moment, I'm the executive director of the Nippon Foundation. But um, prior to um, joining the Nippon Foundation, I was a journalist um, working with NHK and the um, Japan Broadcasting Corporation, Japanese version of BBC. That would be easier. Um, and um, I, I, you know, uh, spent um, of course, when I was a journalist in Japan, and I spent four years in Thailand as a correspondent, and I, I also spent uh, four years in Washington, D.C. as an international um, um, correspondent. And here I am. So, I mean, it's quite a jump. I, I mean, I'm just curious. It's quite a jump to go from journalism and traveling like you've done, and, you know, like the Japanese version of BBC is a pretty big deal. And you've mm -hmm. come into philanthropy. Why did you decide to make that change? Well, it sounds very different, uh, you know, um, between journalism and philanthropy. But to me, uh, they're very, very similar uh, because um, being, um, being a journalist, you know, you find issues, problems in the society and try to, um, you know, report to the society and make them understand and try to solve the problems. But uh, for the philanthropy, you know, we also find issues in the society but the difference is, you know, uh, we have capability to spend some money to make projects and like, you know, uh, firsthand to solve um, problems. That's the difference between being journalist and being an, you know, executive director of uh, a philanthropy organization. So for me, I guess Nippon has been, I heard about Nippon in 2006. I mean, it's a very well-known organization it's invested strategically in big issues for, for a long, for a long time, uh, and has had been very committed to disability. Um, and I always wanted Nippon <laughs> to invest mm, in you. our thank work. Thank you for saying that. No, it's true. I mean, people know that. Um, wh why do you think? I mean, you are very much part of why Nippon has uh, come into a, a partnership with the Valuable Five Hundred. I mean, it's been led by you. Um, why? Why did you choose to partner with the Valuable Five Hundred? Um, 
You know what? Um, you might be wondering why you know the Nippon Foundation is um, endorsing this initiative, um, because we firmly um, believe that we can become um, we you know and the Nippon Foundation, the Valley Five Hundred, um, a fundamental game changer, the game changer of um, existing schemes for supporting uh, persons with disability, um, the game changer of um, the current um, um, dynamism towards an inclusive society. Um, I think this is truly a new um, approach whereby 500 um, leading global um, business leaders, companies uh, fulfill their commitment to take um, the leadership in solving global challenges. Um, I, I sincerely uh, hope to be able to achieve a better world together with uh, everyone by using the new platform, the Valley of 500. But I guess it's, it's quite a different approach. You know, a lot of people fund maybe societal issues or social justice issues. Um, and I guess the Valuable 500's real belief is that the, the scale of the disability inequality crisis is just simply too big for philanthropy or governments alone or or like the public sector bodies or institutions to solve why do you think business is positioned so uniquely to to do this um i think i have to go back to what we have done in the past as the nippon foundation um, the nippon foundation since our establishment over 50 years ago um, has been in constant pursuit of supporting persons with disabilities um, throughout the world, um, th throughout the world, guided by our uh, un 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 unwavering um, principle of one world, one family. Um, all of our activities with regard to persons with disabilities um, are based on our desire to realize an inclusive society. Um, we created a bilingual deaf education system in a Vietnam province where deaf um, children are able to um, study in sign language from primary to university level. It has taken 20 years. Um, we developed um, programs to train local prosthetic and orthotic professionals of international standard in the six Southeastern countries um, where, which were damaged um, by civil wars. Um, it has taken 30 years. It is our chairman's lifetime commitment to eliminate um, discrimination against persons affected by leprosy. Uh, it is taking us for more than 40 years and we are still halfway through. Um, we have supported um, marginalized people left behind from the mainstream of society for a long time. I'm fully convinced that supporting minority disability groups just by reaching out to public institutions as I mentioned, such as uh, governments and uh, United Nations will not bring about uh, effective uh, um, you know, uh, changes um, unless the majority of the society changes, uh, the world never, will never change. But you know what, I mean, let's be honest, if from the Valuable 500 community or family, as we like to say, I think do we have over 30 companies from Japan and we have some of the biggest Japanese business CEOs right. and companies. Right. And I remember when we started speaking to this, you know, you and your team were like, well, it's quite different here in Japan. And yet it's this part of the world has, has taken this up proportionately, probably one of the top countries in the world. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think Japanese companies are coming on board? Do you think that's because Nippon's leadership has made that possible? Do you think that's maybe one leader and more leaders? Why do you think that's happened? Well, I think Japan at this moment is in a very special um, situation because you know uh, we will be hosting, hopefully hosting, uh, Tokyo um, Paralympics uh, next summer, this, this coming summer. Um, so um, you know the society uh, has become more sensitive about um, um, persons with disabilities, not only persons with disabilities, but you know diversity. Um, as you understand, you know Japan is a very homogeneous country uh, mm -hmm. in terms of you know race. Um, 
So um, diversity is um, not um, something that you know we can think or we can feel everyday basis. But since you know uh, we decided, and you know Japan Japanese uh, have decided to host Tokyo uh, Par Paralympic, um, then you know we feel that you know we have to be very sensitive. We have to we have to change, and we have to change our society. That's probably the reason why. You know, uh, uh, 30 companies, you know, uh, almost instantly joined um, this initiative. And so, see, this is where, I, where I'm interested. And you're saying, you know, we as societies have to change. And then there's the power when, say, 30 CEOs, and let's be honest, these are big Japanese companies, these are very influential companies. Right. So, when those sort of 30 companies and CEOs do it, do you find that Japanese society follows? I mean, do you, is that real? I mean, this is an example of business lead society follows. Is that true in Japan? Is that, is that how it works? Uh, I, I think so. Um, you know, uh, because of uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, we cannot, um, you know, um, easily reach out to Japanese CEOs anymore. So to me, 30 CEOs have signed. That's very, very small numbers. Um, and, and, you know, um, uh, if we have, once we have chance to talk with CEOs or executive, um, you know, officers in those big companies in Japan, um, they, they, they can uh, understand, you know, uh, the importance of uh, the Valuable 500 and its initiative, its activities. So it was not very difficult for us to, um, you know, convince those CEOs in Japan to join this initiative. Yeah, but I mean, it was quick. I mean, let's be honest, there's parts of the world that have not in any way had the same level of commitment as Japan has, and, and quickly. And, and I, I guess I'm just interested in the culture of Japan. Um, you know, the Valuable 500 is a collective. It's a community because mm -hmm. we believe together if we share best practice and we, we can help each other and we can build together and innovate together and fail together, is that kind right. of collective community an important aspect for the Japanese com companies to be part of? Is, is being part of a bigger group an important aspect of learning together? Um, I think Japanese companies or Japanese CEOs, um, they agree you know, what we do um, as the Valevo 500 um, in general, but um, they, they, they're trying to find, they're still in the process of finding what they should do um, to have um, um, more inclusive work environment in their companies. So um, in short, um, they, they don't know what they should do. That, that's probably the biggest reason why they wanted to join the, Vi the Valuable 500. They, they are trying to find, um, um, you know, um, find um, 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 particular, um, you know, uh, tools or particular um, means to change their work environment. Yeah, because you and I have talked about this a lot, you know, you know, we get this, so we build this community. And so these ideas are great. Let's be honest, like we have the mm -hmm. intention now. You know, right. like as of today, we're at 420 something companies. We represent 17 million employees around the world in 36 countries. And, you know, this is fabulous. It's a lot of intention. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I met Mr. Sasakawa, he's like, yes, ideas are good, but I want action. Right. And that's so you're funding phase two because it's to translate this intention into action to drive the system change. Mm -hmm. And that's because companies want to know how, right? I mean, you keep saying how, how, how. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I guess is, what do you hope, you know, the success will be? I mean, we're, we're going to be in partnership for three years. Um, what do you hope is going to be the success after three years? Or what is your personal hope for the Valuable 500 partnership? Um, personally, um, to be honest with you, um, um, Mr. Sasakawa uh, did not understand this scheme at all in the first place. So um, it was not easy for me to explain to him and to convince, uh, you know, what it is. Because, um, you know, um, um, we, we, we thought um, this is just a movement. But, um, you know, since we decided to fund the Valuable 500, 
we're expecting, as you said, action, you know, implementation, um, execution. That's the most important phase of this initiative. So, um, uh, well, um, but, you know, um, as I mentioned, this is the first challenge uh, for even uh, the Nippon Foundation, probably for organizations who have long history to support persons with disabilities, um, to, um, to have commitment uh, from, you know, um, uh, you know, global CEO community. Um, so this is a new challenge. So um, at least um, I, I, I thought, you know, uh, it's worth for the Nippon Foundation to work together with uh, Viable 500. But um, in the future, I'm talking the near future, uh, we would like to see um, action. We would like to see um, uh, interaction um, among those member companies within the Valuable 500. Um, um, I guess, so we, we have the Valuable 500 and we hope the Tokyo Games will happen. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've spoken about, you know, when the Tokyo Games are on, that we will bring the, the Japanese business community and whatever their business leaders are in Tokyo at the time together. Um, and I think that's the power of it, isn't it? It's exciting to bring the power of sports, the power of business sure. together, right? Because that collaboration is where we could really see this global system change or societal change. But there's another mm -hmm. thing that you're also the Nippon Foundation are doing. It's it's the True Colors Festival, right? Do, do you want to tell us a little yes. bit about that too? Because sure, it's so sure. interesting. So you you fund sports and you're funding business-led programs and the arts as well. Right, right. Well, um, you know, um, in the past, the Nippon Foundation um, has had or supported um, persons with disabilities. You know, for example, uh, we have a scholarship for, you know, um, those young students with disabilities uh, to be able to go to uh, university or even, you know, uh, graduate school. Um, but um, it, it, it was not easy uh, for those um, elite, elite, you know, um, uh, students with disabilities to find jobs after they graduate, after they receive even, you know, master degrees. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought, you know, we have to, um, uh, we have to change, you know, society must change, you know, uh, um, we have to change um, the mindset of uh, mainstream uh, or, you know, the majority of the society to receive, um, to allow those, you know, a person with disability to be a part of the society. So a True Cause Festival, uh, we call it, uh, it is um, an event. Uh, well, well, this is a um, performing arts event um, created by um, artists with disabilities. So um, we bring um, singers, dancers, um, or other uh, performing artists with disability um, on the stage and to show their capabilities, their potentials to the audiences. And those audience, you know, most, most likely they are uh, regular, normal uh, people who do not think about persons with disability in their daily lives. So um, it is very, very um, uh, easy for um, um, you know, those ordinary people to uh, witness, uh, to see um, what um, persons with disabilities can do. So um, it can be um, you know, um, a point that, you know, I mean, mainly we have this event in Japan at the moment because of the COVID-19. Um, um, I, I think, you know, I mean, at least those audience who actually um, been to those uh, events uh, of uh, uh, True Calls Festival, they, they, they change their mindset. And now um, they feel, you know, uh, they understand uh, persons with disabilities much better than um, they, they used to. So um, this is events, a series of events that, you know, we're trying to um, advocate to the society, the regular society um, of Japan. Um, I have two questions that, that I just wanted to ask you um, and just give me an honest answer from because I think this, I think people listening to this would really love to hear. Um, why, 
why did you you personally what you know anybody who's here who who's like me who works endlessly never gets paid never imagines that a, an organization like nippon would be our partner you know i mean this has been really hard building the valuable 500 i had to remortgage my home and everybody thought i was mad and crazy and and sometimes you feel like like you'd give up mm -hmm. and in a way i think for me personally is like why, what did you see? What did you see that maybe others didn't see, that other foundations around the world didn't see? And I think other people who have ideas like mine are sitting there going, oh my gosh, you know, how could I have a Nippon relationship going forward? So what did you see or what would you say to anybody else who has an idea or an initiative or a program around, you know, looking for a grand partner? What would you say to them? Um you know, what we have before us today is, uh, you know, social innovation, the Valuable 500 um, has led the way to the first challenge, uh, bringing inclusion commitment into um, the global CEO community, you know, the, the mainstream of society, um, stressing the economic benefits of employing people with disabilities um, based, um, not on the concept of social welfare, but on the firm belief in their potential. Um, as, as, I, as I mentioned, um, you know, the Nippon Foundation is trying to change the society um, through helping, supporting um, persons with disabilities directly. But um, we, we, we have done that for more than 50 years, but it didn't work. And it was a um, very perfect timing for the Nippon Foundation to um, um, you know, meet you, um, to know what the Valley of 500 is trying to do. Because um, we, um, in a sense, we have come to an include a conclusion that um, we must change our um, projects um, in order to support persons with disabilities. Um, you know, the real change if we see uh, real change, we must reach out to um, the majority of the society. And here comes the value of 500 with you know, 500 um, global um, leading companies and its CEOs. And, um, it was just perfect timing in that you know, we are looking for a new challenge, um, uh, you know, new way of um, supporting um, persons with disabilities. Well, you still took a risk. I feel I think you took a risk where nobody else really was willing to. Um, and that was I think that's really important, sort of like our chairperson, Paul Pullman, he took a risk when nobody else was willing to. And there's often magic in that. I think there's moments, isn't there? Um, mm. So before we finish, I guess I'm really interested because you have traveled around the world. You, you said, you know, before that you've been into D.C. and you've been in Hong Kong, you know, you've traveled a lot. And we're kind of the same age, I think, ish. Um, have you sure. seen um, the way the world sees disability as being different in different parts of the world as a journalist? And, and how, are, are you seeing it changing? And, and what's your hope? Um, definitely. Um, I think um, it's changing, you know, um, how they see persons with disabilities, um, not only in Japan, um, but also on uh, the rest of the world. Um, I spent a um, few years in Washington, DC um, as a correspondent. And at the time, um, you know, I was specialized in uh, national security. I, I covered the Pentagon. So mm -hmm. it was totally different from what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, um, I mean, in, in the US and um, compared to uh, in Japan, um, uh, it was, um, you know, uh, there were more options for the persons with disabilities to work, to live, to study. Um, and in Japan, you know, we have infrastructures, uh, you know, I mean, um, many public areas, um, public uh, places, um, uh, you know, they, they, they care about, um, um, you know, um, barrier-free mm -hmm. um, inclu uh, inclusion of, you know, in inclusiveness. But um, 
Well, uh, I think um, if you go to uh, countries like Thailand, of course, you know, those infrastructures are not very sufficient for persons with disabilities. But their, their, their mind, their feeling, you know, um, towards persons with disabilities, um, they, they, they're, they're more, you know, what word I'm looking for? Um, they, they are more kind. Compa to... I think they have more empathy or compassion or something. Yeah, is, is that what yeah. you mean? Yeah. Yes. So um, not like, you know, European countries on, on United States, Japan, um, you know, roads are very, not, not smooth at all. Um, and there are not very uh, good, you know, signs for persons with disabilities. But, you know, if they see uh, persons with disabilities, they, they're willing to help. And in Japan, um, that um, it's coming back to, you know, what I'm, what, I'm to, what, what I'm trying to do at the moment in Japan. But, you know, Japanese, they feel they, they want to help uh, persons mm. with disabilities. But in a sense, they're shy and they don't know how they can help um, those people. So, um, you know, of course, um, um, there are differences um, in, you know, different parts of the world, but, you know, um, they, they feel um, they, they're willing to um, support, they're willing to live together with, you know, um, um, yeah, to, to, so it, I think what from what I notice in Japan is there is that real fear of causing mm -hmm. offense, right? Real right. fear, right, right, of uh, hurting somebody or embarrassing themselves or embarrassing somebody. And actually, I think that's something that's not just Japanese; it's something everybody feels, and mm -hmm. particularly in business. And one of the real barriers that we've noticed for business leaders to come on board is fear of getting it wrong. Right. Like they're so worried about getting it wrong. Um, so yes, you, I, think, I think actually that's probably one of the greatest problems that we see and the greatest obstacle we need to overcome. And I think that's one of the core things we can try and achieve to get in the Valuable 500. That it doesn't matter what country you're from or what company you're from, it's a safe place for us to learn together. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we could do that, that would be incredible will be a huge step forward. Um, sure. So I am going to say thank you. Um, I know that everybody out in the Zero uh, Project family, because actually it was through the Zero Project that I uh, finally had my introduction into the Nippon Foundation. So in a way, I have to thank the Zero Project and Martin Nessel and Michael Fenbeck for making that connection happen. Um, I know that if there was no pandemic and COVID, that you would be in Austria. I would be there too and in a way it would have been brilliant for everybody to meet you but I just want to say from the Valuable 500 family from all the people that are working for a more inclusive world through business we want to say a huge thank you to the Nippon Foundation to Mr Sasakawa and your team but particularly to you Ashiro um, thank you for believing in us and uh, I hope we will make you really proud well, thank you very much for having me. But you know, we're expecting you um, to get you know uh, accomplish something new. That's why we invested um, money uh, for your uh, project for for your initiative. Yeah. Okay. I've been told. I know. I, I have to deliver and execute. I will. Yeah. We have we have our targets and our to do lists, and we will do it. But the first step was to to believe in us, and so we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's our story. We are gonna to work together to change the system as much as we can in three years. So don't think this is about one person, not at all. This is about so many of us. And I just want to say a huge thank you. And I also wanna say a huge thank you to Martin Nessel, who when I had absolutely no money, um, he just said, well, you know what? Here's something to keep you going. Big change takes a long time and I'm really impatient, but I nearly have to wait 19 years to make this one happen. But I'm so proud of where we are today. Something is changing. Something is happening. This is the decade of disruption. The rule book around diversity and inclusion has been totally thrown apart and thrown open. And now we need to step in and look after each other and collectively we can actually change this.